This video is a medical information piece that was created primarily for my fellow classmates at the CNA Spring 2016 cohort at FAS. So if you hear me referring to you guys or something specific like that, then that's who I'm talking to. But the info herein could be of interest to a lot of different people, so I decided to release it publicly here on the STEM at Play channel, even though this channel hasn't been launched yet. Regardless, if you find this information helpful, then please feel free to like the video, share it around, leave your comments below, or even subscribe to the channel for when it's actually launched. If there's enough interest, then we may do more talks like this in the future. Hey guys! This is just a short informational video about MCR1, which some of you may or may not have heard about in the last couple of weeks before the class ended. It's the latest in the stream of headlines about antibiotic-resistant bacterial strains hitting the mainstream news channels, and some of you may have even seen it mentioned in local news, if you still watch that sort of thing, or even in Facebook feeds. So the questions that a lot of people are asking, and which we'll try to answer briefly in this video, are, what is it exactly? Is it really that big of a deal? And for us who are entering the healthcare industry, should we be worried about it at all? Now to really answer those questions, we should compare it to stuff we already know. And in class, you may remember we talked about something called MRSA. You may remember it as some other bacteria that's also resistant to antibiotics, and maybe even remember that it's fairly contagious and can be a problem in healthcare facilities and hospitals, and that it's one of the things for which you need to use your PPE, or personal protective equipment, when it's around. What you may not remember, because honestly not a lot of people actually memorize it, is that the letters actually stand for Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is just the genus and species of this particular bacteria, and just like it sounds, when you hear the term staph infection, then it means this bacteria from this genus. Resistant means resistant, since we're talking about bacteria that's resistant to antibiotics. But the key term we're interested in right now is this one, methicillin. It should be pretty obvious that methicillin is a kind of antibiotic, but I'm going to make a list and put it right about here, near the top. Technically, methicillin, or as it's called nowadays because it was renamed back in 2005, methicillin, is a narrow-spectrum beta-lactam antibiotic of the penicillin class. But unless you're going into pharmacology in a serious way, ignore all that noise and just focus on this little bit. Penicillin class. When most people think about antibiotics, they think penicillin because it's the most famous by far, and it's easy and cheap to make, generally speaking anyway. And so it's everywhere, and several penicillin derivatives are on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. These are the medicines that you'll find in lots and lots of different hospitals, healthcare facilities, clinics, and so on. Methicillin is a member of the penicillin class of antibiotics, but has actually been discontinued in favor of newer, more effective antibiotics, some of which are also in the penicillin class, but they still call MRSA, MRSA, just to avoid confusion. But that actually doesn't matter for us, because what you may not have known is that MRSA is actually resistant to all beta-lactam antibiotics, which includes all penicillins, and also the cephalosporins, which is a whole nother class of antibiotics. Now that may sound scary, and in fact it kind of is, but some of us have dealt with MRSA easily enough in clinicals, and obviously the whole human race hasn't yet been killed off by MRSA and other superbugs. Some of us have even said, eh, it wasn't even that big of a deal in clinical. One thing you have to remember is that while MRSA was first identified back in the 1960s, it was in the 1980s when HA MRSA and CA MRSA were first identified. That's healthcare-associated MRSA and community-associated MRSA, for those of you who may not remember. And it was a huge deal at the time, because it was a brand new thing and because a lot of outbreaks were being reported in hospitals and communities, for example, between intravenous drug users. And so that was probably the first widely publicized OMFG, superbugs are going to kill us all, wah, moment. Or not even moment, because the hype lasted for most of that decade and the next decade. But if you ask just about any doctor today, especially those who were doctors back in the 80s and the 90s, they'll probably tell you that MRSA is so typical and commonplace these days that every single time there's some kind of staphylococcus infection, they just pretty much immediately assume that it's MRSA. So be careful, put on your protective gear, follow infection control procedures, keep calm, and we'll be all fine, right? 
Well, for now, kinda. Because another thing you should know is that antibiotic-resistant bacteria isn't a new thing, and it wasn't even new back with the MRSA scare. The antibiotic tetracycline was introduced in 1950, and we found tetracycline-resistant Shigella bacteria in 1959. The antibiotic erythromycin was introduced in 1953, and we found erythromycin-resistant Streptococcus in 1968. The antibiotic vancomycin was developed in 1972, and we found resistant strains in 1988. Hell, we even found penicillin-resistant Staphylococcus in laboratories in 1940 before penicillin was even being mass-produced. I can go on, but you get the idea. And so, while we keep finding these things over the years, we've been okay, and dare I say even pretty good, at dealing with them. But let's zoom in a bit with more recent news, say within the last six or seven years. One thing to keep in mind is that I'm not going to go over every single bit of news in this time frame, or we'd be here for like an hour. Instead, I'm going to concentrate only on those news stories that made it from the medical journals and into the mainstream news media. A lot of you may have heard some of these stories. In 2009, there was an outbreak of pneumonia bacteria in Detroit that was resistant to both colistin and carpobenum. We'll talk more about these two antibiotics later because they're kind of important. In 2011, 18 people at the NIH were stricken by a similar strain. NIH stands for the National Institute of Health, which is one of those organizations you'll see mentioned a lot when it comes to healthcare and medical research, alongside other big names like the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Walter Reed Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and lots of others. This 2011 report made the news not only because it happened at the NIH, but also because out of those 18 people who were infected, 11 of them died. And so in many people's eyes, this was the second major oh crap news report in the saga of superbugs after the MRSA scare. In 2012, a major news article circulated stating that antibiotic resistant superbugs were found in 37 US states. In 2013, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, sounded their own alarm to raise awareness of quote, deadly untreatable superbugs, end quote. In 2014, the CDC reported on a very highly resistant Pseudomonas bacterium in imported squid from South Korea that was resistant to carpobenum, an antibiotic that we mentioned earlier. In 2015, the CDC reported an international spread of Shigenella soni because they discovered that 90% of cases in Massachusetts, California, and Pennsylvania were resistant to ciprofloxacin, another antibiotic. So you may have noticed we're seeing widespread news stories not every 5 or 10 years anymore, but pretty much all the time. And once again, these are just the big stories. I haven't even mentioned CRE, which is Carpobenum Resistant Entobacteriaceae, or VRE, which is Vancomycin Resistant Enterococcus, or MDRTB, which is Multidrug Resistant Tuberculosis, or yeah, we're finding a lot of these things. Which brings us to May 26, 2016, and this thing called MCR-1. So, is it just another thing in this big list of bad things, or is there something special about this one? Spoiler alert, if there's going to be a third oh crap piece of news when it comes to antibiotic resistant superbugs, then it's, there's a pretty good chance that it could be related to this, though we're not completely sure just yet. MCR1 doesn't refer to a particular strain of bacteria, and in fact, the bacteria in question here is just our old friend Escherichia coli, or E. coli. There are actually two things about this particular strain of E. coli that are the reasons it's such big news. As you probably guessed by now, a strain of it has been found that's resistant to antibiotics, and in this case, several different antibiotics, but most importantly, colistin, which we mentioned earlier which is part of the polymyxin class of antibiotics. And colistin belongs on the list here. And so does the antibiotic carbapenem, which we also mentioned earlier, as a carbapenem class antibiotic. The antibiotics at the top of this list, including many, but not all, penicillins, are the common ones. And like we mentioned earlier, they are available almost everywhere. For that reason, they are often considered the first-line antibiotics, because they're often the first thing used to treat infections. These guys in the middle are also somewhat available, but not nearly as much for whatever reason. Maybe 
cost or difficulty to produce or narrow scope. So they're not quite as prevalent as the first liners. Now these guys at the end, they're the ones considered to be the last line antibiotics, also known as drugs of last resort. This may or may not be due to rarity, but the key is that when the common stuff fails because of antibiotic resistances, these are the guys you turn to. Remember that one major reason for the spread of resistance is the overuse of antibiotics, and so maybe these have not been used as often, and thus resistance is rare. Or maybe they're newer, and so resistances haven't had much time to develop yet. But as you can imagine, when a bacterial strain is discovered that is resistant to a last-line antibiotic, that's what's going to make the news. Colistin is actually decades old, but it fell out of popular use because of kidney toxicity issues. But then when antibiotic-resistant bacteria started to spread, colistin came back as a last-line antibiotic because it was found to still be effective against some of them. And so, colistin is well known as a last-line antibiotic today, despite being fairly old and relatively cheap. And MCR1 E. coli is resistant to it. So that's reason number one. The number two reason, and arguably the most important reason that MCR1 may be such a big deal, comes from the fact that the resistance is plasmid-mediated. A plasmid is basically just a little ball of DNA that is separated from the main chromosomal DNA in a cell. The problems with plasmids is that they can replicate independently, and they can pass on genetic information through HGT, or horizontal gene transfer. When we normally think of transferring genes, we think of passing chromosomal DNA from parents to children, known as vertical gene transfer. Plasmids allow for genes to be transferred from one bacteria to another without reproduction, and it's even been seen to transfer genetic material to entirely different bacterial species. And when a plasmid encodes antibiotic resistance, that's when things start to get really bad. The first evidence of plasmid-mediated MCR1 E. coli was the SHP45 strain found in November 2015 within pig farms in China. China's laws on antibiotic use, especially in livestock, are very lax, and so in order to raise animals to feed their huge population, it's become common to use an old and cheap antibiotic like colistin on livestock. As you can imagine, this quickly led to colistin resistance in E. coli, and scientists eventually performed a study and found colistin-resistant E. coli in 21% of slaughtered pigs in China. And, not surprisingly, they detected colistin-resistant E. coli in more than 1% of hospitalized patients. This may not seem like a huge number until you consider that out of only 1,322 patients sampled, it was found in 16 of them. Scale those numbers up to an estimated total number of hospitalized inpatients with infections in China, and you get the idea. Since then, evidence of the MCR1 mechanism have been found in Malaysia, England, Denmark, Portugal, yeah, a lot of places. On May 26, 2016, while we were happily studying away in class about MRSA and other stuff, a woman in an army hospital in Pennsylvania with a UTI was found to have MCR1 E. coli. As you can imagine, researchers from the Walter Reed Army Medical Center started moving right away and they were all over it. They were able to effectively contain it and thus prevent an outbreak, and you can bet that they are still researching it, like, right now. But let's not hit the panic button just yet. Here are some facts. This was only the first occurrence of MCR1 E. coli in the United States, and it was contained pretty quickly with no other occurrences found, not even in the same facility. This strain of E. coli is also still susceptible to other antibiotics, including carbapenem, and so it is still treatable. MCR1 E. coli is still out there, and it was only a matter of time before it showed up here in the United States, but it's not likely something that you'll have to deal with, not for a while. Its plasmid-mediated transfer is certainly something that has the medical field worried and can potentially become a very serious issue, but it remains to be seen exactly how serious. For now, you can bet that some of the best minds we have are working on the problem, and it has certainly brought the issue further into the public spotlight. The G7 and G20 groups and the WHO are working to coordinate some kinds of actions, hopefully sooner rather than later. It's almost certain that you'll have to deal with MCR1 eventually, but whether that is months or years from now, 
We just don't know. Nor do we know if it'll be an OMFG, we're all going to die situation. Or, more likely, maybe it'll be just a remember to use your PPE properly and you'll be fine sort of thing. At least, let's hope so. And finally, remember that we have something that wipes out more than 99.99% of infectious bacteria and viruses. It's cheap, it's readily available, and every facility stockpiles it in volume. It's pretty badass. It's called soap. Remember to use it. Thank you for listening. References will be listed in the description. Once again, if you find this info helpful, then please feel free to like the video, share it around, leave your comments below, or even subscribe to the channel for when it's actually launched. If there's enough interest, then we may do more talks like this in the future.